<coughs> Salam alaikum. Excuse me for my voice. I've been sick for the last couple of days. Thank you very much, all of you, for accepting the invitation and coming today. Thanks to the Mosque Foundation for giving me the privilege of the floor. I don't have any financial benefit from giving this presentation or any commercial benefit. I am not a world expert historian. I'm just an average Libyan physician um, who loves his country so much. I did my homework. I read a lot about my country, and I will try to summarize the history of a country that goes back thousands of years BC. A country that many, many of people, they don't know. A story of the land that I came from. A history that many of us didn't read in, a, in the uh, school books or on, watched on TV. Um, I will be talking about a country that was hostaged by a tyrant for many years, that was kidnapped and imprisoned behind the bars of dictatorship, and their people were terrified for many years. A country that their people tried many times to break the chain, successful in doing that, but ultimately they stand for their principles and they broke their chains and the whole world stand for them seeking their freedom, dignity and respect. A country with a lot of hidden treasures that Libyans opened the doors for the world to share these treasures with them. I will be going through a lot of facts be inshallah in the near future one of the leading countries in the region and in the continent. And this is not just triggering your emotions or just talk but these based on facts that is not set by me, but the facts that was calculated by the international community, United Nations and its organization. <clears throat> I will be talking about historical landmarks. They represented a different era of the country's history. A landmarks that if you go today to Libya, you will enjoy. A landmarks they go back to a thousand years BC. Libya, the third largest country in Africa. It's located in the north part of the continent, bordered by Egypt, Sudan, Chad, Niger, Algeria, and Tunisia. <laughs> million population with a growth rate of 4%. And a diversity of ethnic group, a majority of them are Arabs, Amazigh, Tabu, and Berber, and, uh, and uh, Tawarq. Islam is the country of the religion and the majority, the vast majority of Libyans, they understand the way the religion was taught to us by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a religion that teaches love, respect, a religion that contributed to the human civilization. Libya is the lar a country with the largest reserve of oil in Africa and the seventh largest reserve of oil in the world. This is the second country exporting natural gas and it's ranked number 20th in the world in terms of foreign exchange currency reserve and gold with a 130 billion dollars that makes it more it makes it richer than Canada and United Kingdoms United States is ranked number 19 and it's followed by Libya United States Canada and United Kingdoms who are tens times bigger than Libya that's how that's 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 what makes Libya how much and uh, how much rich. A country that has a profit made a profit last year of 33 billion dollars and makes it and makes it ranked number four in the Arab countries after Saudi, Kuwait, and Qatar, and number 14th in the world. After the revolution, the inflation rate dropped to 3.4 from 15 percent before revolution, and the growth rate was a 3.7 before revolution and increased to 121.9 after revolution 2012 makes it the fastest growing the fastest growing economy in the world based on the CNN uh, finance and money magazine but this rich country because of the injustice dictatorship one third of its population they live bef below poverty line with an income of less than one dollar a day and one-third of its people they are employed 
and a corruption perception index ranked 172 out of 56 country in the world. Well, thanks God, we making a progress and we dropped 12 points last year and we became 160. Many of people, they, they, all what they know about Libya is a desert, oil, and Gaddafi. Well, let me tell you today more about this country. It's a true that 80 to 90 percent of the country is a desert. But this desert, it's like its own people. It's very well civilized. The air, the wind, the sun, the humidity, the sands, they sculptured all this art work in the desert. The desert has been an attractive point to many tourists across the world. And this is one of the volcano chains in the middle of Libya. Behind the dead view of the desert, there is life. And there are many oases across the country. People, they come to join the natural view, the silence of the desert, the food, and the generosity of the Libyans. Our Western friend, they brought their downhill skating skills and they are playing downhill skating in the Libyan desert. However, they don't know that it snows also in Libya. This picture is from the Medina al Bayda or the white city in the eastern part of Libya where almost every winter it snows there. And this is the administrative building of Omar al-Mukhtar University. This view was taken from Tripoli a couple of years ago. It doesn't snow as much as in Chicago, but we may get snow once in a long while. And this is in the western mountains of Jabal Nafusa. Libya has the longest coast in the Mediterranean, 2,000 kilometer. And with the Mediterranean weather, we have a lot of orange farms and olive farms. We also have waterfalls, and this is Derna waterfalls and Ras Nalouf or Ras Hilal, sorry, waterfalls. The capital, of the, Lib the capital of the country is Tripoli. It's the political and the economic capital with almost three, two million population. The second largest city is Banghazi. And the world famous city, Mizrada, as well as the city of the rebels, Zawiya, and many other cities. This is the new old flag. It's the flag of independence. And this is a copy of the independence constitutions explaining where the colors of the flag came from. And here it says, in the words of the well-known Arab book, our deeds are the color of white, our battles of a black, and our meadows of a green, and our swords of red. It's the story of a, live, of a lifelong struggle and reward, the story of innocent life and a pure blood shed in the cause of a freedom, liberation, and defense of our country. The story of a painful past with its dark lonely night and a smiling future with peace and plenty for the whole nation. The story of life itself, evolution and progress, development and change, the bright future, the noble aims and the long march. That's what our flags represent. The name of the country came from a long time story. Egyptians named the land east to the delta of the Niles to the Atlantic Oceans as Libya. And the people who lived there, who are Amazir, or the native people who lived in North and Sub-Sahara region, they were named by Egyptians Libo. These facts are written on the walls of, a, uh, of the uh, Karnak temples in, in Egypt. It's also well described in the temple of, a, uh, of the pharaoh uh, Merneptah. The name of the land that was given by the Egyptian was passed to the Phoenicians as well as the Greek. And all of us we know how much Greeks were fascinated by legends and myths. And they mentioned Libya in their Homer's Odyssey when they say it's the country of infinity, a country that has flowers. It's called the uh, lots of flowers. If you eat from them, you forget all your painful past and you live forever. Herodotus, the father of history, 
when he drew the first map of the world, Libya referred to the continent of Africa before the name of Africa exists. And then the Romans named the land east to Delta up to the city today called Derna, Libya Inferior or Libya Sufla. And west from Derna all the way to the dark seas or the Atlantic Oceans, Libya Superior or Libya Ulya. In the southwestern of the country were a chain of mountains called Mountains of Akakos. They are a few kilometers afar from one of the largest city in the south, Ghat City. These mountains harbor caves, and these caves have a story that goes back 12,000 years BC. It talks about a civilized people, an artist who lived in that region, and they documented their lifestyle, what they did every day, by painting on the walls of the caves. If we travel 1,100 years ahead, during that time, Egypt was experiencing difficulties. And the people who lived in the north and sub saharan region, which used to be called Libya, and the people who lived there, Libo, their civilization is peaking, is raising up. So Ramses II, the pharaoh, Ramses II, asked the Libyans for logistic support when he had a fight with an invaders. But that tells you that there was a civilization raising in North Africa, and as history tells us, when a civilization peaks, their dreams become unlimited, and their resources limited, so they start to look at their neighbor countries and they invade them. And the Libyans did, under the leadership of a Libyan leader named Shishank. He's the founder of the 22nd dynasty of the pharaoh's family in Egypt. He ruled Egypt, North Africa, and Sub-Sahara. But his dreams didn't stop him there. He invaded Sudan. During that time, Asham, or which is known today Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, was under the rule of the Prophet Suleiman, peace be upon him, or King Solomon. That stopped him. He couldn't invade the Sham because King Solomon was very stronger than him. But after King Solomon died, Shishang invaded the Sham, and that was the first time in the Egyptian history where the Egyptian pharaoh ruled Sham, North Africa, Egypt, and Sudan. Libyans controlled Egypt for almost 200 years, and after that, they were defeated by Egyptians back to their land. All these stories are written on the wall of Shishank at his gate in the temple of Kurnet in Egypt. Now, as I said, they controlled for 200 years, they become weaker, and they were defeated back to Libya. Now, when I say Libya, I'm not going to talk about North Africa and Sub-Sahara, but I will be talking about Libya that all of us know. About 100 years BC, when Libya that we know start to reform, and the three famous states, Cyrenaica, State, Tripolitana, and Fizan, they start to begin oh, that the first time when these three states exist. So, because as I said, Libyans, they become weaker and they couldn't have a control of their lands. During that time, two civilizations were rising. Phoenicia and the West. The Greek, as I said, and their legends and mates, they had a dreams about this country. They thought it's the heaven. They thought it's the land of infinity. If you eat from its lotus flowers, you will live forever. They send their traders to the east part of the country. Exactly, they landed in a small city, it's not known, between Tobruk and Derna. It's called Umur Zum. They, they landed there and they start trading with the native Libyans, Amazir, for many years. And then uh, they got married from them. And then after that, they ask for a piece of land so they can establish a, city, a Greek city. The natives refused. However, they showed them a land, a fertile land that didn't belong to the tribes who lived there. This land today is called Shahat. 
in the Green Mountains was very fertile and it has a lot of tulips flowers or a zambak al -birri. So the Greeks founded their first city, Medina Shahad, and they named it Qurina, relatively to the tulipus flowers, which is, which is called in a Greek word, Kor, and they called the city Qurina. It's very well reserved ruins till today. This is the temple of Zeus and Shahat, and the theater of the old city. However, as with every civilization, people, when they get stronger, their influence extends. And that city was not enough for them. So, they took a city on the shore and made it a harbor for them. It's called Susa, or Apollonia. And that was the second city. And then a third city in the, what's called today, Al Marj, or what they called it, Paki. And a fourth city, which is known today as Banghazi, used to be called as Yusipertas. And a fifth city, which is Medinet uh, Tokra, today is known as Tokra, and used to be called Arsino. And that's how they established their five cities. And in the old Latin words, five is Pinta, and Polis is cities, and they call their state Pintapolis or the state of the five cities, and they got control of this whole region, and they were the founder of the eastern state of Libya, or, or after, ultimately was called Cyrenaica. During the same time, Phoenicians, the other raising power in the eastern part of the hemisphere, they were traders, and they had a control of the Mediterranean. They know North Africa very well. And they had a dream to control this land. As I said, civilizations, when they peak, their dreams become unlimited and their resources become limited, so they look for lands and resources. And they occupy the western part of Libya, and they are the founder of the Tripolitania state, or the three-city state. They build Tripoli, what's known Tripoli today, or Trablus, and they called it Oya. And a second city, Sibrata, which is called today Sibrata. And a third city today is called Al-Khums, used to be called Liptus Magna or, Magna, or Lubda Al-Kubra. The Phoenicians, they were traders. And when they, were, when they founded these three big cities, they started trading with Africa. And that's for the first time when Libya became a gate to Africa, where all the goods comes from Asia, Far East, Middle East, Europe, and they go through Libya to Africa through the Phoenicians. Phoenicians had a dream to control the southern state of Libya, which is Fezzan, which was controlled by Germans. A civilization was founded and ended there in the desert. Fezzan won't let them, or the Germans, they were stronger. The Phoenicians ended up as an allies with them, so they can let their business go through the country to the Africa continent. And then after 100 years, another power start to raise, Romans. And they had a dream to control the region, like any other powers. And the Phoenicians went into a war under the leadership of Hannibal. Phoenician's capital was in Tunisia, in a city, Carthage. And they had a long war with the Romans, ultimately ended up by Romans, they took over and they controlled the region. Tripoli was invaded by the Romans 200 years AD. The emperor of Rome back then, Marcus Aurelius, let me tell you a fact about Romans here. Romans, when they win any war, when they want to celebrate a victory, they build an ark, and they call it Victory Ark in a city. And maybe the most Victory Ark that we know is the Victory Ark in Paris, but there are many other Victory Arks. And this is one of them in Tripoli. It's called Victory Arks of Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome back then. 
And that is what is left only about Romans ruins in Tripoli till today. This is another pictures of Marx Aurelius victory arc at night. It's a very it is in the old city of Tripoli. And then the second city, Liptus Magna, which is today known as Al Khumus. Liptus Magna is the city of a Libyan emperor, actually a Roman emperor who is originally from Libya, Septimus, was born in Liptus Magna from a Libyan father, from a native Libyan father. He's an Am he was an Amazir too, like all the natives who lived in North Africa. His mother was a Roman though, and he lived all his life in Libda city. His grandfather was a knight, a businessman, politician, very rich man. He supported him a lot. He sent him to Greek and Rome to study law. He became a lawyer and a philosopher. Came back to Libda, or Liptus Magna. And then, after many years, became a senate in Rome. And then he became a governor of a southern state of Spain. And then ultimately a commander of the Roman military army. He invaded Sham, and that one became part of the Roman Empire, and got married from a Syrian lady. Went back to Rome, and he was announced as the emperor of Roman Empire. During his time, Rome extended, and unite and the what's today we know as a United Kingdom, or specifically England, became part of the Roman Empire. Septimus Sifros, a Libyan legend, took an excellent care of his city, Libda. And it's still today the largest well-reserved Roman city outside Italy. Their people, or his people, honored him. And they built victory arc of Septimus Sifros in the city. The city has the largest Roman theater in the world outside Italy. The third city was Sobrata. What's known today is also Sobrata, and this is the theater of Sobrata. Very well reserved Roman's ruins. An attractive spot to many tourists. A lot of mosaic work and very nice large theater too. Now the third estate in the southern Libya which is named Fezzan, was founded by the Germans. And fortunately, this civilization was birthed by the desert. And because the country has been going through colonizations and wars and dictatorship period, so no one got the chance to learn and find out about this civilization. And still unknown civilization. Amazigh, who are the natives or the people who lived for thousands of years in North Africa and Sub-Sahara, they still do exist till today. And this is part of their ruins in the Western Mountains. They are a minority because majority of them converted to an Arabs after Islam arrived to Libya. Now, when the world was controlled, the Western Hemisphere was controlled by the Romans and the Eastern Hemisphere was controlled by the Persian. A new emerging power started to exist from the Arab Peninsula, from a land no one expects to be a powerful. Islam. But the leadership of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Muslim Empire extend and expand in Egypt under the rule of the Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu an, was part of the Khilafa and the governor of Egypt was Umar ibn al-As. Uh, Umar ibn al -As. The Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab sent a letter to the governor Umar ibn al-As to prepare an army to open North Africa. 20,000 soldiers of companions and 
followers. They were heading toward Libya. On the first line, there was Sayyidina Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiyallahu an, al Hussein ibn Ali radiyallahu an, the son of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ubaidullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, Asim ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, Ibn Sayyidina Abi Bakr, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr ibn al-Siddiq, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-As and his son, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-As, and many others, companions and followers. They were marching toward Libya. They knocked the doors on the eastern gate of Libya. Egypt was under the rule of Muslims. Libyans, back then, they were Christians. And they were following the Coptic Church in Alexandria. After Alexandria became part of the Muslim empire, Libyans in the eastern state, they didn't show any resistance, and they opened their gates for the Muslims. They opened eastern state, became part of the Muslim empire. One of the stories that the son of Sayyidina Umar ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-As, he fell in love with the Cyrenaica state, which is after the, uh, after Muslim, after the companions opened the state, they called it Wilayat Barqa or Barqa state. And he said that if I don't have a wife and a business in Mecca, I would live the rest of my life in this, in this land. Sahaba marched toward the west part of the country, to Tripoli. Tripoli was well protected by Romans, has a high walls and towers, surrounded by a water trench. Very difficult to get into the country. Was saged by the Sahaba for months because it was not easy to open the city. They had to build operation room for the commanders, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-As. That operation room is the mosque. The mosque was not just a worship temple, but it was everything to the Muslims back then. And that was the first mosque built in Tripoli. It was built in a place in Tripoli, it's called the Dahra today, but it was destroyed by the Spanish when they invaded the city 100 years after. Ultimately, the city opens its doors and became part of the Muslim world. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-As sent his soldiers under the leadership of a uh, under the leadership of his son to open the south of the state which is Fizan state which then ultimately became part of the Muslim world and then Libya became a Muslim country ever This is a close image of the old city of Tripoli with its towers and walls. And this gate on the left lower corner was built during the first Futuhat al-Islamiya by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-As. He built this gate and another gate close to it which is bigger and we call it today Bab al minshiya which is relatively to the tribes who lived across that, the, the area where the gate was built. Now, Islamic history in Tripoli. I, I don't have the, first of all, let me, let me say this. I don't have enough time and I don't have the, enough knowledge to go across every single details about the Libyan history, but I'm just going to, you know, just going to speak about, just going to give an example. So I don't want anyone to be offended that I didn't speak about his city. Every city in Libya has a history. But I'm just going to take one city and talk about just a few examples in that city. Hundred years after the, after basically Khilafa al hafsiya and the Muslims became very weak and the, and the Amawiyin were defeated from uh, Spain, and all the Muslims and Jew, they departed Spain. Spanish, they invaded a lot, most of the cities in North Africa and destroyed most of the Islamic uh, cultural buildings such as mosques and schools. But a few mosques are left with a lot of history, historical significance. One of them in Tripoli, it's called Jama' al-Naga. 
is, was built more than a thousand years ago by Al Mu'izzu li Deen Allah Al Fatimi, the founders of Al Khilaf Al Fatimiyyah. He was marching from. Okay. So he was marching from Tunisia toward Egypt to establish his Khilafa and to build his capital city, Al Qahira, Qahira al Mu'izz. And when he rested in Tripoli, he built this mosque, Jama' al Naga. I'm going to talk only about mosques. I'm just going to give two or three examples about mosques that they are very old and they are still functioning till today. Second mosque, Jama' Sidi Abdul Wahhab. 800 years old, was built during Khilaf al Hafsiya, still functioning till today. Jama' Sidi al Sha'ab, 700 years old. All these examples are in trip. I just picked one city and I can't go through all cities. And a lot of, there are a lot of examples and many cities and I can't cover it. I don't have enough time. Jama' Sidi Sha'ab, 700 years old, was built at the end of the Khilaf of Hafsi, unfortunately, was destroyed just a couple of months ago. And then at the end of the Khilaf of Hafsi, Muslims ward become so weak to the point that their enemies greeted them. Muslims were, as I said, defeated and departed from Spain and Spanish. They were haters of Islam. They went after Muslims into their countries and they destroyed their countries. Tripoli was one of the victims. And a lot of Islamic history in Tripoli were destroyed by the Spanish. They, they ruled the country for just a few years and they handled it to the Knights of St. John for San Qaddis Yohanna or the, or the Knights of Malta. A huge massacre, thousands of people, they were killed, crucified on the walls of the city by the Knights of St. John. And then during that time, Muslims regrouped, united. They started a new empire, which is the last Khilafa in the Muslim world, Khilafa al Uthmaniyya. During the Khilafa Uthmaniyya, the Khilafa Uthmaniyya in Libya was divided into two era or periods. The first era or al Khilafa al Ahd al Uthmani al Awwal, and this is what is left from that time. This is the gate that you see, it's called Bab al Bahar or the gate of the sea because it's facing the sea. And the mosque behind it is called Jama' Darghut Basha, was built 1500. BC, sorry, uh, AD. Jama' Shayb al Ain, more than 400 years old. Jama' al Guptan in Zawid Dahmani, about 500 years old, and many others. After the Uthman Khilafah lasted for about 200 years, and then Libya became an independent state. It was part, still part of the Ottoman Khilafah, but politically was independent from al Bab al Ali or the capital city of Istanbul. And during that time, a Libyan family called Ailat al Garamali or al Ahd al Garamali, where they ruled the country independently from the capital city of Istanbul. Tripoli state was under the rule of. Ahmed Bash al Garamali and Barqa state was under the control of his brother Yusuf Bash al Garamali. This is the mosque of Ahmed Bash al Garamali and this is his palace as well as this and this. And this is the, this is the western gate which is, was built by Ahmed Bash al Garamali. Now, during that time, Libya went into a war during the Ahd al Garamali or the Garamali era or period, Libya went into a war with Americans. Muslims back then, during the Khilaf al Uthmaniyya, they were controlling the Mediterranean. And they won in the Mediterranean Sea 
unless people pay taxes so they can trade. You pay tax, so Muslims will protect your business, and that's how it worked back then. The ruler of Libya, al Garamalia, they raised the tax. Americans refused to pay extra money. So he prevented them from trading across his shore or the Libyan coast. The United States government didn't like that. They sent their navy with a four battleship to, to, to Tripoli. A fight lasted four years. It's called Harb al-Sanawat al-Arba, between Americans and Libyans. And after four years, uh, 1700, i pretty sure. Sorry, 1800, 1803. That's when the war ended. In 1803, the war ended, Libyan Marines, they were able to sage the largest battleship called Philadelphia, and they brought it to the shore of the city. If you see here, if I can point, this is the sail of the Philadelphia battleship. They put it on the top of Be Beit al Barud, or the Tower of Guns. And it still exists till today as a symbol of victory. And if you hear Americans or United States Navy anthem, which starts with from the halls of Montgomery's to the shore of Tripoli. That's where it comes that from. After 100 years of the rule of the Garamalia family, and a new era started, which is Al-Ahd al-Uthmani al-Thani. What do we have till today from that period? As an example, the, the clock tower in the old city of Tripoli was built in more than 200 years by the governor Na Muqbasha. Other example, the oldest college in Tripoli, more than 150 years old, still functioning till today. It's called Islamic School of Arts and Skills and still working till today. Tripoli Central Hospital was built back then, at the, at the mid-18th century. And the right picture is a relatively old picture, is the new, new picture of the building. The hospital is still functioning till today. It's part of the University of Tripoli, Faculty of Medicine Hospitals. I did part of my training there. And many of my colleagues did part of their training there. Then, the world was changing. And the first world war started. And the Khilafah Uthmaniyah ended. They lost the war. Turkish, they were defeated from all the Muslim countries back to Turkey. In Libya, after Mu'ahad al sykes Biko, and they divided the whole Muslim world into the states that we know today was invaded by Italians under the rule of a bloodthirst commander the president of the fascist back then Mussolini Libya didn't have an official records during that occupation but what Italian recorded they killed more than 900,000 Libyans that was more than half of the population of the country and 150,000, they were deported from the country. There was a tremendous amount of resistance against the Italians. Italians, they couldn't settle down this resistance. So they sent their horrific criminal, called Graziani, commander, to Libya to end this resistance. I'm sure many of you watched the Lion of the Desert movie, or Omar al-Mukhtar movie. That tells part of that story. Many others, Mujahideen leaders in Libya, 
they fought against Italians, such as Sliman al-Baruni, Khalifa ibn Askar, and many others. One of the things Graziani did to scare people so they can stop fighting Italians, they built concentration camp. And by the way, concentration camp was an idea, first time tried in Libya, as well as a uh, attacking cities by, uh, by the um, airplanes and tanks, I guess. But anyway, one of the largest concentration camps was in the eastern part of Libya, which is called Mu'taq al-Agila. And if you watched the movie of Umar al-Mukhtar, when they brought him and they executed him in front of his people, they executed him in the... Uh, where thousands of people had to watch him. Hundred thousands of people died of starvation, thirst, and heat stroke. Concentration camp. Libya, or Libyans, they founded their first army, the Nidus, or the nucleus of the army, by the family of Sunusia. And they allied with the allies, because that, during that time, the world was changing again, and the Second World War was about to start. And the Libyans put their hands with the allies. They fought against Axis power, or the country of Axis. It, Italy was part of one of them. Fortunately, allies won the war, and we fought with them. Italians were deported, defeated, left the country. And Libya became under the guardianship of England. And then Libyans, they gathered together and they elected their leaders, they wrote their constitutions, and they went to the United Nations asking for independence, which they had back in December 24, 1951. A couple of months later, we had an elected parliament, an elected president of Senate, an elected chairman of House of Representatives, and elected governments. There were four parties functioning back then. There was a freedom of speech and demonstration, hundreds of independent journals and news, and a normal relationship with our neighbors and the world. At the end of the 60s, nationalization movement or nationalism started in the Arab world, was founded by Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. And the idea spread across the Arab world. Gaddafi led a coup against the king. The king was on an official visit to Turkey. He commanded his army to do not fight or resist against the Libyan soldiers. So it was called white coup or bloodless because there is no single drop of blood lost during this coup. And the king left from Turkey to Egypt to live the rest of his life till he died in Saudi Arabia. Three or four years after the coup of Gaddafi, he disabled the constitutions of the country and eliminated parties and dissolute the senates as well as the House of Representatives. And by this, he had a complete control and the power in his hand of the country. A year later, he nationalizes all the companies in the country and criminalized private business, so he had a control of the economy of the country. The first revolutions that Libyans, young people, was in 1976. They appraised against Gaddafi because he took everything from them. They don't have the right to choose their leaders, to control their countries. He had the absolute power in his hand. But in the 70s, the world was different. Criminals, they can do anything to their people. And no one would ask them to stop. 
So, he used his army and he killed thousands of people at the University of Benghazi and University of Tripoli. And he won. And that was the largest, the first, and almost the last revolution happened. In 1977, just a year later, he declared the state of mass, or called Libya al-Jamahiriya, where he claimed that Libyans, they have a complete control of their power, money. But in fact, that was not true. We did not have any normal relationship with our neighbors. We went into a war with Egypt in 1977, and with the Chad, between 73 and 87, and Tunisia from 74 to 78, conflicts in Darfur, he abducted and killed Musa Sadr in 1978, and we never had a normal relationship with Lebanon. In 1990, he insulted the king of Morocco, and, we, and the relationship was ended back then, as well as he supported a... Um, people against the, uh, the Saudi king and government back in the 80s and we never and he insulted the king and he nev we never had any normal relationship with Saudi as well as he supported Iran against Iraq and Iraq against Kuwait. Now in Africa we were involved in a war against Tanzania supporting Idi Amin and Gaddafi founded a war revolutionary center in Benghazi where thousands of Africans were trained. And some of the famous people are Kumbaro, the president of Burkina Faso, and Debi of Chad, and Taylor of Liberia, and the uh, Sanko, the founders of Sierra Leone, as well as Bukasa, a Central African Empire. We were also involved in a war, civil war of Sierra Leone. He spent millions of money on the Red Army factions with their Nazis to dream to control Europe in Germany, as well as the Red Brigades in Italy, and the Irish Republicans. He killed the, the British uh, police officer, Fletcher, in 1984, and, and bombed the uh, La Belle Night Club in Germany in 1986, Lockerbie in 1988, Utah French airplanes, in 1989, as well as he's responsible for killing more than 1,200 prisoners in Abu Slim prison, which is called Abu Slim prison massacre in 1996. These people's a crime. They ask for their principles, human need. They want to practice their religion without limitations. They want to just live a normal life, ask for freedom and dignity. They were killed. And he is responsible for injecting 400 Libyan's children in 1998 by HIV in Benghazi. So there is no wonder why another revolution would start. Libyans, they tried many times to assassinate him and end his brutal rule, but they couldn't. 2011, the environment was ready for another revolution. And Libyan says, enough is enough. And the revolution started on February 15, actually, 2011. His famous speech, when he named Libyans rats and hallucinated people. The National Transitional Council was founded in Benghazi on February 27, 2011, under the leadership of Sheikh Mustafa Abdul Jalil and the Executive uh, Office Chief Mahmoud Jibril. The whole world stand for us. They supported us. We asked for a normal, basic human needs. And we got the support from our Arabic neighbors, as well as from the international community. The resolution 1973 and 1970 were no-fly zone, and, and, they, and they freeze all the Libyan assets, so Gaddafi does not have any access to use it for a military purpose. The International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant on June 27, 2011, against Gaddafi and his sons. The war started, and every one of us know what happened. 
the last battle of Tripoli was on August 24, 2011. And the turn fell down. He escaped from Tripoli and he was captured in a sewage pipe. He named Libyans rats and he was arrested in a sewage pipe. His son was arrested a month later and the country was announced liberal from a four decades of tyranny, dictatorship on October 23, 2011. First elected government was on November 1, 2011. And the power was translated smoothly. It was a dramatic story that we lived in the region where 21 political parties represented Libyans in their first elected General National Congress out of 55 practicing political parties in Libya today. The power transitioned smoothly from the Transitional Council to the General National Congress. And a second elected government announced on November 14, 2012. But we are going through a lot of challenges. Libya has been sick for years. It has been under sages. And now, we are trying to build a nation after a war. We have a security challenges, weapons everywhere, and a national reconciliation. My dream, and I hope, and I am sure, based on the facts I just talked about, based upon the enthusiasm Libyans they put for their countries where thousands and thousands of people killed and injured during their freedom battle, Libya will be in the near future leading country in its region. And it's going to be your first choice to visit and your best destination, inshallah. Thank you. fascinating uh, journey through the history of Libya. I'm a Libyan, but I really don't know too much of these details that he mentioned. So that's very uh, interesting. Uh, we open the floor for any questions or comments, hopefully around the uh, subject, from both sides. From the I don't know why too. I mean, he is. I mean, all of us know. All of us know that he is a. Uh, <laughs> I remember in the 80s, you're right, the banana just started in. I think they started importing, importing banana on. And a little bit of chocolate from Tunisia, but banana in 1988 or 1889. I don't have an answer to your. I wish if he's alive and he can answer your question, I don't have the answer. I mean, every one knows that Gaddafi basically was a psycho serial killer in a public office. He was not a normal person. And I have no idea what he, why he did what he did. So, But for a fact, we know what he did. Sure. Well, I, 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 first of all, I don't know extreme details, but sure. Yeah. No, actually, Al Mu'az Lidin Allah Al Fatimi, the founder of the Khilaf Al Fatimiya, uh, he was Tunisian. And he went to Egypt, and the capital of the Khilafa was in Al Qahira. Al Qahira was not a known city, it was not a city. He actually the founder of the Al Qahira, which was called Qahira al Mu'az. Yes, during the Khilaf Al Fatimiya, the uh, 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 Shamal Afriqi or North Africa became Shia. 
uh, it was a Sunni, and then they became Shia under the influence of the Fatimiyyin, and that. And, and ironically, Iran and all the eastern part, they were Sunni, they were not even Shi'i. And then the image flips around. And, and then North Africa became Sunni again uh, after the hukum of Adarisa, Salajiqa, and Muhyiddin, and Murabitin. And, and then the, uh, and then the uh, Iran became, or the eastern part of the Muslim world became Shi'i. As a matter of fact, uh, for, for the last few years in his, in his uh, Rule, Gaddafi, he was promoting the, and he was alluding to the Fatimi uh, dynasty and how they can be. Actually, the Libyan flag is a Fat Khilaf al Fatimiyya flag. Their flag was just basically a green flag, it has nothing in it. So. In. يعني في أي بأي قصد عن تأثير. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, well, uh, موجودة. Uh, uh, it was part of the Khilaf al Atmaniya, and uh, Sufiya, that's when it flourished actually during that period. Libya, Sufiya, Kila Mojuda, Ila Lyom Filibia, like in Zaykul Shaif Dunya, it's it's not an abs Hiyashi Ani Shar Mutlak or Khair Mutlak, but it has its good parts, which is such as they Hafadu Yani. كثير يعني هم لهم دور في تحفيظ معظم الليبيين القرآن عمر المختار اللي تربى في المدرسة السنوسية كانت حركة صوفية في ليبيا واللي كان لها الفضل في نشر الإسلام في أفريقيا لكن ممكن ما يؤخذ عليها الحركة الصوفية من بدع زي التبرك بالأولياء الصالحين إلى غير ذلك ولكن ليبيا was part of the of the خلافة عثمانية back then when the صوفية flourished across the Muslim world so صح ليبيا هي كلها ست ملايين ولكن لا اله الا الله, الله هذا المركز اللي مسك الدكتور يوسف القرضاوي شو اسمه الجمعيه الجمعيه العالميه العلماء المسلمين هيئه هيئه رابطه هيئه العلماء المسلمين they conducted actually a research study in Libya they were looking for لان لان جمعيه الدعوه الاسلاميه اللي في ليبيا they claim that they have a uh, one million half of Libya. So actually they investigated that and Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, if he, he can go, I think there's also a video when he said that was true. There was one million half of the Quran. They are not just half din uh, Hizb or Juzu, there's one million half of that memorizing the whole Quran from skin to skin. Yep. Well well it's the truth. Come <laughs> salam. Definitely, I will, unless I found, where is that, the, oh, you took it again, all right, so let me hear quickly, I'm just going to go here and tell you some facts, it's not a philosophic facts, they are facts on, you know, um, here, all right, here, okay, so, economic facts, Inflation rate drops from 15% to 3.4 after revolution, as well as the growth rate of economy raised from 3.7 to 
to 121.9% and became the fastest growing economy in the world. So these are economic facts that are promising for the country's future, as well as we know very well that the country is the richest. In fact, it's, ri it's richer than a uh, United Kingdoms and Canada in terms of how much reserve of money they have in the international banks. Now, these are economic facts that are promising that this country with its small population, that they can stand up. Now, second fact is Libyans, when they stood against the uh, Gaddafi and they, f and they fought against him, and they sacrificed their, their sons, thousands of people that were killed, and they didn't do that for fun. They did it because they want improvement now. I, I am a surgeon, and I look to Libya as an old sick person who's going through a major surgery. My expectation after surgery, he's not going to go home in a day or two. He's going to end up in the ICU sick for a few days, and then he will be in the floor for a few weeks, and then will be in the rehabilitation unit for months. Now, this is a country who has been sick for many, many years, and it does not have the uh, uh, institutions to stand, to stand up after the... Gaddafi, what he did, as I said there, he reduced the whole country with all its institutions into his person. So when he lost the war, we ended up with a country without institution. In fact, if you look into a country that is without institutions and every single person is armed, it's very safe. There was no single violations has been recorded. There was no, none, none, zero. And I can challenge you for that. None of the people attacked banks, stolen money. None, zero. That's true. People, they fight, they kill each other, and then when rebels, they don't like anything, they would go straight to the, uh, to the executive authority or the, the National Congress asking for, you know, for whatever they need. And, 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 and we are part of an Arab world where we have a warm blood, where, you know, like, we, we do not take the time, we don't discuss. We, you know, we talk, and then if you don't listen, we fight. But... If you look at the other part of it, when you see that every single person, he's not armed with a gun, he's armed with tanks, with anti-airplane, you know, like 14.4, they call it, you know, uh, uh, weapons or whatever. You know, and there was no major events happen in the country. Banks are safe, and they can't attack them. They are safe, for example, you know. So that's, that's a hope to me. Schools are functioning. My mother is a teacher, and she went to school since the liberation of Tripoli, and she's been functioning. The schools, the hospitals, I mean, there is an event once in a while. I mean, this is a country who was established 100 years ago, and uh, it has a strong CIA and, and everything. And when, the, when there's a tornado, and when the lights goes off, and, uh, uh, or what, uh, you know, and then they will say in the news, well, there, you know, all the shops and banks are, you know, <laughs> the money in them vanished, you know. So, so that tells me that these people, they hold a lot of principles, and, they, and, and to me it's very promising. Uh, actually, we have two minutes to finish, so I will go and uh, make it short. Uh, okay. لأن my understanding in uh, Libyans or uh, they they they've been through a lot and all what they want is a country that where they can live with not just their own because they got now their dignity and respect but and they want a country with institutions with a clear plan with a plan that would tell them even if you lie to them but if you convince them and you tell them that I'm going to change your country in this number amount of years with this clear plan consistent of one, two, three, they will elect you. They don't care anymore. Who are you? All of them are Muslim. All of them are Sunni. And they don't care. So I guess what makes el, uh, the Islamic parties, they don't, you know, um, win most of the seats is I think they didn't have a clear view. They didn't convince the street. And I think if they do, 
I think they will win. That's that's my answer to that. Okay, Doctor. Sickness, uh, which you uh, describe about Libya today, is the same sickness in Egypt, Tunisia, and other countries. But what you see about the uh, uh, change of perspective or thinking about the relationship with the neighbors right now, uh, is it is going to be uh, sooner or will we wait until the uh, uh, recovery happens in years, I think? The, the strength can come with coalition of these new uh, revolutions and it may make it faster to develop in the area. Sure. Uh, I think I mean Libya is not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay west to Egypt and east to Tunisia and Algeria, and these are our neighbors, our brothers, and uh, and we will always have a normal and a good relationship with them, no matter who's controlling the country. Even if during the the ruler the the the, the period of Gaddafi and we did not have a normal relationship. I think this relationship, I think the new rulers of the country, they want to build this normal relationship uh, based on institutional um, and, uh, and, and not a personal biased view. So, um, and, and, and one other fact is Gaddafi, because I mean, with all the wealth of this country, that if you visit Libya, it is retarded country that one-third of its people are poor and Gaddafi did not invest any of that tremendous amount of money. So where did the money go? The money went, you know, we talked about, like he spent the money in Africa and the whole world and, and, and ultimately that's, that's what we ended up with. I think Libyans, they are very sensitive now when any of the politicians would say I'm going to give or donate or support another country because their countries is not just a third world country, it's even worse than that. We seek schooling and medicine, att medical attentions and everything outside our borders. Tun Libyans, they go to Tunisia and Egypt to study and to seek medical attentions. So basically, people, they, I don't, th we Libyans, definitely, we don't hate our neighbors as a people, but I think we are just like a kid who was a, uh, did not have an attention and was neglected for many years, and now he knows his father is so rich and he wants all that attention. I think once they fill their stomach, and they see their countries building, and they see all this. The, the you know the countries is, is standing up. I think after that they won't care. Uh, the relationship will always stay normal. It, it's not going to end okay. anywhere. Zakmalakhir for your uh, attending. And, uh, thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. For this uh, interesting.